we have uh, uh, coming back together here for a little bit to see, uh, to uh, explore what our group learned, but also what did the, what did the other group learn, or the good ideas um, that surfaced um, in order to prepare tomorrow to talk about ways that not only can we make our own personal teaching better at our places, but now support one another, and not just for teaching, but also for um, research purposes, for our own research, but for the, especially the research purposes of our students. So um, Bob has asked, Bob is uh, uh, got the, running the camera over here, has asked that if everyone would please speak as loudly as I do, it would make, a, it would make for a better video. But you ask, yes, Tom. Pardon? The purpose of the video? Where is it? Where are you going to end up on YouTube? Or? We're selling it. We're selling it. Thank you very much. You can sign it up. I don't know. Uh, be on the Here, website. Can you, uh, Ken Dennis. Ken Dennis. Yeah. 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 We have a website, www.newcity.cu.edu, and there's an i 70 quarter thing. And initially, it will show up there, and then as we build our own website, we can separate it off if we have one fit for this uh, consortium. It'll be there and available for everyone to look at and for us to analyze as a part of the regrouping for all the ideas. I see. Does anyone have an objection to? Was it an edited version or like a edited? Pardon? No. Is it edited or pull the small one out? Can we Photoshop? <laughs> <laughs> or can it be a private link that we know that the public doesn't? We, it can be anything you guys decide at the end of the day tomorrow. We'll take them anyway, just for if it's nothing more than a way for us to gather the information so we're not all taking notes. And, and then if you decide that it should be private, totally, whatever, we'll just do what the group decides. That's a good point to raise tomorrow, uh, the, the, the use of these materials. Um, so uh, each group had a reporter. Our reporter is uh, intrepid, and uh, and she's prepared to uh, to go. But uh, Susan, or who was your group's reporter? Please. Kelly. Kelly. Really, do I have to go first? <laughs> Why don't you go first, Kelly? <laughs> Just me. Um, all right. So I have these notes, and I can barely read them, but I'll make it go here. So we talked about um, what did we talk about? We talked about about education and how um, to um, prepare students for the complexity of gerontology and reading studies. Um, we talked about how at KU, and actually UNKC's School of Medicine is the same way, there's an interprofessional focus on educating students. And uh, to some extent, there's, there's experiential pieces um, involved in that, so that you have, um, for example, at KU, they have uh, a team of students from various interprofessional health allied disciplines that work with uh, geriatric patients to, um, you know, uh, deal with their issues and help manage their their um, health concerns and, and, and other needs at, uh, around, around their health and well-being. Um, so then we talked about involving um, like service learning for students, and the importance of having students um, have real experience in the community and in different agencies that serve older adults. Um, we also talked about um, the, the, the pros and cons of like simulations, setting up uh, simulations uh, of what it may feel like or certain, you know, uh, physical limitations that may occur as a person gets old. Um, but we also talked about how, how there, there may be a downside to that. Uh, we talked about um, that there's, there's a certain subjective bias in creating simulations that may not be very educational as far as um, experiencing age, quote unquote. Um, 
We definitely talked a lot about critical gerontology and the need to um, incorporate critical gerontology with more of the professional disciplines. Um, what what is that critical gerontology? What is, gonna, may I interrupt to just? Oh, could you want to say? Yeah, I think one of the, the, the things we discussed as a tension was a tension between what academics like you and I might approach the subject with versus what someone who's thinking about it from a practice perspective might approach the, the subject with. So, um, you know, if we're thinking about the goal of a class, then, you know, the goal of, of a gerontological class or training program could be very different depending upon if you're approaching from trying to get a certificate and learning the competencies for a certificate versus trying to approach it from a critical perspective of understanding theory uh, and uh, other aspects of going forward. Yeah, thank you. Um, but, but we also talked about the need that there needs to be some integration as well. That to have just a, a practical, quote unquote, education or approach to aging isn't sufficient. That you also need, to some extent, uh, you know, some critical understanding or, or skills in, in being critical about the construct of aging. Um, let me see if there's anything else to. But we also talked about like um, the credential in gerontology, the CPG, and the benefits of trying to structure curricula to pursue that or not. So I think the piece that I got out of it is that we tend to think that the, uh, what's going on in the professional training program in social work in medicine, OT, um, is quite distinct from what's going on within our, our um, uh, more traditional academic fields in psychology and sociology. And, and, and what I got out of it is that there's a lot to be gained from, from both perspectives and for working out um, a, a, a hybrid approach where we could benefit from the sort of <coughs> interdisciplinary uh, uh, team-based approaches with the, the case studies, virtual case studies, other kinds of things. And they could benefit from our kind of um, uh, emphasis on critical thinking and, and uh, uh, identity and um, uh, as a stepping away from the emphasis on uh, disabilities and, and uh, clinical I got to say in the School of Social Development that one of our four guiding principles is a critical perspective. And everything I do under the topic of nothing makes me happy is that we be critiquing. So uh, thank you very much for we actually do do critical thinking in the social development. That's great. I, 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 think, I, think, I think we do when we have theoretical on our How about in medicine? Do you do any of the critical thinking? Anybody yeah, learning in medicine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't think anyone wants to apply that, that there's no critical thinking in professional programs. But I, I do think, at least from my perspective, when I'm thinking of the student who's approaching a class, I have to ask, what does that student expect to get out of that class? When there's, when there's a class, what is the goal of the class? If, if it's a class within a professional context, many cases, the goal may be very different than if it's a class that has a, a purely academic context. In other words, if I teach a class, I don't think anyone in my class thinks it's going to help them get a certification from anyone. They're simply there because they're interested in the topic. Whereas I think that there's a legitimate expectation that if you take a class from you, that students in your class, that they should be getting some competencies that will help them towards that certification as well as some of the yeah. What about competencies? about the development of this critical thinking. Right? That's great. But I, I don't think that's always the case in every social welfare program in the United States. I don't know about you, Colleen, but it's, it's one of the EGA It is. It, it actually is part of our educational standards, our national standards. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, well, great. Maybe where this came up in our group was we were talking about if you place, if students are invited to go to settings or they're invited to go to firms or they're invited to go to uh, agencies. agencies or organizations and um, they hear things, there's a due diligence and responsibility on the part of the professors when they come back to, to um, uh, deconstruct this or, or talk about the outcomes and make sure that the outcomes or the learning is shaped in a way isn't, isn't wholly controlled by the setting. One might actually have to correct what happened out there, and, and there actually might be failed failed experiences out there from which we can have the lesson on. Train wrecks. Train wrecks, yes. Let me add something. case we were talking about interprofessional kinds of education, mixing that possibly with what? Liberal arts kind of stuff? Or critical critical came up at one point. Wasn't that it? Yeah, conceptual. Conceptual, Kelly conceptual kind of stuff. And with the agenda is different perhaps, you know, in those two things. But it's like social things. Yeah. Different perspectives. 
contempt. I mean, it, it's something that we we should probably teach about because we're going to face that. You know, you're going to face it, you know, especially when you, you know, my students, for example, just one example, when I student, they get PhDs, they, they're very critical in their perspective, we teach that. They go out and get a job in agency, they become disillusioned because they're, what about this? What about subjectivity? What about uh, all these kinds of things that no agency is interested in? They're interested in the patient or the client. You know, that's a different subject. So that's that's what I'm saying. It's, it's a real dilemma. Okay, why don't we have Stephanie? Sure. Uh, So like if you're, um, in terms of experiences, um, if students are doing assessments or just um, interviewing or talking to people, um, what do you do with that information? Um, what if you, for example, are doing an assessment, if you could, you know, uh, discover an issue that's maybe not been known before, um, how do you handle that um, as from a, um, you know, a, a, a teacher or mentor perspective, how do you work with students with that and how do you prepare maybe the individuals that have volunteered their time to be interviewed by um, your students or to go through an assessment, how do you prepare them for potential kind of outcomes of that? Um, we talked about um, an over, over emphasis on differences um, and kind of us versus them piece um, and how we may need to do that a little less. Um, the importance of ensuring mutual benefit, whether it's um, on an individual level or an organizational level, um, there can be um, learning from both sides. Um, and I don't know if anyone wants to throw out something. Oh, I know one thing in terms of we talked about um, wanting to do more was for um, um, or how we're kind of structured. Um, graduate programs is uh, we'd like to see more um, multi-generational education or really creating um, classrooms and campuses and settings where um, people who might not be in the 1824 range feel comfortable being there and um, you know, as we live longer we might be shifting careers or wanting to go back to school or do whatever and so um, we really need to start um, Well, I 
think I would simply, uh, it was partly related to the issue of mutuality, that um, if, we, if we hold the older adult up as an example in class, this is the demented older lady. And it's a one way sort of looking at that person as opposed to a mutual interchange where you're knowing the full person that that, that and the other point I guess that I made is that I, I worry in gerontology sometimes that we, we so strongly emphasize the difference that we forget that every one of those people we're targeting were young once. And so anyway, that's all. Okay. I, I think I I would maybe add one, one other element that was, was coming up, and I was um, the importance, talking about the importance of when older people, are we exploiting older people? Are we using them as exhibits, or are we taking advantage of them? As, here, come in and here, press a button, you'll talk about your pension, or, or whatever, and um, it, was a, it was a strong uh, uh, endorsement of the idea that uh, people are very, very proud to help us in our um, they're probably unlikely to feel that way, and uh, we should try to think of them as teachers of our students, as co-teachers of our students, along with uh, us as the formal professors. That came up in our in our group too, and we, we talked about that how that can be problematic. And you said, "Why did you, it sounds like that you discussed it?" We also talked about finding opportunities to maybe get out of the classroom and look at, at age, uh, kind of decontextualized from the classroom. Like, and we discussed Oldenburg's idea of the great good place as an example of that. Like looking for the great good place. I think our, most of our discussion was focused on this issue of, of trying to reinvigorate um, undergraduate education, but also uh, trying We didn't really talk too much about um, graduate training in, in, in our disciplinary areas. Something that the reporters didn't cover. Well, the, the point is you have online versus in person, mm -hmm. and that's, I, and I, I terrified of online, staying away from it, but I, I, I was gratified to hear the online Why, sorry, why are you afraid of online? Why are you terrified of it? Because <laughs> I'm a practice skills-based instructor. Okay. And so I, I need to be able to observe uh, students in action to be able to assess competencies. And so uh, for me, it would be a foreign thing to try to do that online. I'm not saying I can't, but it would be a real, it would be a sea change from the my approach now. Well, I, I only bring it up because Susan and I are having a conversation just after the session about using hybridized approaches to move some things out of the classroom because all the things you're talking about take more time. You know, we're talking about adding things, not taking things away. And we're trying to come up with strategies you know, that this would work, but just strategies that, that could help with that find more time in the classroom. Nora was talking about um, what it's called virtual case studies, right? Uh, uh, Yeah, yeah, we do have standardized patients that we use with the medical students uh, that they actually throughout their medical training go through um, have actors um, like but, but also wasn't there something on an online oh, and then we now? also have a virtual case so this virtual. is the same for professional virtual case that we're developing now yeah yes and that sounded like a very interesting idea that you take <laughs> yeah. out out of the their their kind of clinical focus but into you know have, have virtual older adults as, as well who have interesting like courses like experiences that uh, could be part of something that uh, students could interact with as we move forward and the way that this is set up it's set up for people to communicate between themselves and, and in an asynchronous fashion they, don't, they can be at their computer at whatever time and asking other people in the group or um, questioning the, the patient the, I think that that could be a format, which is the fact that you're interacting yes. when you can't 
And it would, yes. it would have to be around the, the, the medical crisis. you have a network of people that you've developed mm -hmm. and you can bring that network into your classroom, uh, you may not have the resources to actually do the kinds of, of examples and have people come in. And though I do think there's an issue with online education, it's the first year, okay, you're trying to build an online degree for our entire college of liberal arts and sciences. I would tell you that, yes, there are, there are issues. Um, certainly, I would love to have an opportunity to have some of the people that you brought to your classroom and have that in a virtual environment that you I can access that. at any time. You could, you know, videotape them and right. you could be interacting right. in live email. Right. Right. You know, right. you could, there could be ways that you could interact with them and interview them. And then that's, mm -hmm. that's our, the, the virtual piece that mm -hmm. could, mm -hmm. could be taken, taken to a, like a broader Another way that that was suggested too, because some of the clinical, uh, some of the clinical <coughs> education has established relationships with uh, sites and nursing homes and so on. For example, in social welfare, why don't I, who don't teach that way, have I don't teach those kind of classes? Why don't I piggyback on uh, the relationships that my social uh, welfare professors have? And I could have Andre. It actually hasn't occurred to me ever before to come over what, one block away. And, and, and say, um, could you give me, could you let me into this place or that place or mm -hmm. give me entree here? Because that would sure save a lot of time. Because one of the one of the themes was the amount of work that it takes to maintain these relationships with sites and places. It would be more efficient if I could uh, glom onto someone else's work. Well, and the social work is doing this forever. We have learning contracts. So when they go into the agency, they know and, and we know that there's going to be critiquing of what they're doing. We also share our textbooks, and we don't force it down their throats, but if they want to read it, that's just fine. And then they come to campus, and we meet with them and discuss the pros and cons of what it says in the textbook versus what's going on in real life. So we've been doing all of that forever. So yeah, we've got we've got fun.
and we have an office with staff that manage that. So that is less on you as the professor. I used to do it on myself. And, you know, I was going to say, weren't you the head of practicum? I was. That yeah. helped a lot. I seem to not be talking about that. I don't know what that means. But no, I, I mean, I think that's sort of separate from what we talked about in our group, because that's, you know, that's different than just kind of getting some exposure in an agency. That's a thousand hours. Well, talked we're, out. we're talked out, but, but we probably want to give you the, a, a charge for tomorrow. So, so for tomorrow, we want to do better. We want to move forward. We want to think about how we can draw on one another's strength some of these wonderful ideas in order to expand all of our uh, missions and, and, and educational framework. So I'm not just going to piggyback on my School of Social Welfare. I'm going to piggyback on Washburn, and I'm going to piggyback on K-State. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, what, so what, what are some practical steps we could take? What might be some of the, the real barriers that we might encounter, and how could we cluge around them, right? which is what most of us have learned over the course of our career how to do. Uh, and uh, how could we move forward, right? Because some of you are much better teachers than I am. And, and I, I, I dearly wish, there's never enough of us at any one university yes. that, that, that we feel that we've covered the material capably, capably the, the range or the comprehensiveness about aging. How could I get my students exposed to what it is that you do really well? Is it possible to do this across institutions? Okay. It's your charge. No. Yeah. Um, let's. We can. You can spend time now. Um, at, we have a reception starting down here at five thirty, and dinner at six thirty, and it's supposed to go to eight. We promise. Eight is it. Not go past eight. Um, if you need something to do between now and. Uh, 5:30. They do. They, they they sell things on the next floor. When we get started. <laughs> well, they sell. Well, they sell a lot of. They sell a lot of merch up there. I, if you don't have a KU T-shirt, buy that. But if you want a beer, they sell those. Too. That's what I'm doing.